Underneath all this rubbish are remnants of what life was like here in Oxford 200,000 years ago. Over there, archaeologists have discovered evidence of huge tusked mammoths and giant elephants. Can we find out more about these animals? Have we got the resources to recreate the environment in which they lived? And is it possible that we can find clues as to whether our early ancestors, prehistoric man, lived here too, side by side with the mammoths? What do you think of that then, Carenza? Wow, really? There's some hole, isn't it? That's fantastic, isn't it? We ought to that, go and see. That over there, that's where the business is. That's the site in the middle there, that's where all the dirty brown yeah, stuff still is. Yeah. I mean, this is, let's be honest, this is typical of yeah. about, I don't know how many percentages of Paleolithic sites in this country, <laughs> yeah. simply because most of them, or a lot of the good ones, are in gravel pits. Yeah, mm. and they've got so, a way to take so the top I mean, off. So, I mean, you know, I mean, this is this is pretty pretty typical. Yeah. Big holes, lots of water, yeah. and lots of rubbish. Yeah. Well, let's yeah. go down and see Tony first yeah. and see what he's what he's looking at down there. It's good job it's not raining. I hope it stays we, like this. We'll we drown our, if it rains. We need our abseiling <laughs> kit, don't we, down? <laughs> So what's this level here, Phil? Well, this is the Oxford clay, uh, Tony. It's about, uh, about 150 million years old. Wow. But that's not really why we're here, you see. Within the Oxford clay, there's a channel been cut, and in there is our site. But what you've got to realise is that that whole channel has been sealed by this amount of gravel. We're up, we are going up the slope there, was gravel that was laid down by the River Thames. Very, very cold climate at that stage. And so that's why we we're standing in this enormous so, quarry. Well, we ought to go over and have a look at that. Yeah. Come on. It seems the water from a huge river carved a channel through the clay that lies at the bottom of this quarry about 200,000 years ago. A remarkable collection of mammoth and elephant bones have been recovered in this channel by archaeologist Kate Scott and geologist Christine Buckingham. But their excavations have failed to find the channel edges and the areas of prehistoric land beyond them. Intact land surfaces from this far back are extremely rare, but crucial if we're going to learn anything about prehistoric environments. Over the next three days, we're going to search for this land surface with techniques more normally used to detect man-made features. And for the first time ever, Geophys are going to try and use their instruments to distinguish clay banks from a gravel riverbed. How practical is it in the course of three days to use your kind of technology in order to create a picture of this area? Well, I Two hundred thousand years me. ago. <laughs> I was rather hoping you would. Um, yeah, we're not used to working in the sort of situation where we've lost twenty feet of topsoil and <laughs> gravel and. We're sort of below ground level, so it's an unusual challenge for us, to say the least. But there's a river course to find, you know, an, an yeah, old, an so old abandoned river, yeah. uh, which is only just under the, the gravel that we've got. If the weather stays like this, we might be all right. Yeah. But if we get some rain, it then too wet. it's yeah. going to confuse yeah. results. And can we get that data onto computer? Well, we so, think yeah. we can. I mean, we're waiting, you know, to set up the computers, and we think as soon as we get that data in, we can then actually do a 3D visualisation of the landscape and move around it and light it. And we think well, we can do it, yeah. We're, we're talking it, positive yeah. already, <laughs> aren't we? Yeah. What, about, what, about, what about Victor? What can you um, do for us? Uh, absolutely amazing range of animals in there. You know, I've been practising my mammoths last week. You should have field day. I'm good at mammoths. <laughs> well, it's uh, 10.35 on day one. Uh, we've got quite a lot to do, I think, if we're going to be able to <laughs> yeah. create this picture of this landscape 200,000 years ago. So. Uh, Let's get moving. Right. Right. Prehistoric sites like these may look barren, 
but they contain a wealth of tiny environmental finds like seeds, insects and mollusks. Our air shelters will house all the technology needed to analyse these microscopic clues. We don't know much about the environment 200,000 years ago, so it'll be fantastic if we can gather enough information together to reconstruct the ancient landscape here. Even less is known about our ancestors at this time, but if we do find land here, then we can start looking for evidence of early man on our river bank. Half past 11 and our first trench is cutting back beyond Kate's excavations. This is part of the river channel, but we may be lucky and find an edge. Kate's been prevented from excavating the site more extensively by the constant discovery of bones, and it seems our first attempt isn't any different. A large bone takes three days to excavate properly, and we can't afford to spend that much time on one find. But try telling Phil that. Yeah, hang on, Phil's getting excited about something. What's, what's going on, Phil? Oh, it looks like a bit of tusk coming out, doesn't it? Maybe. Is that tusk, is it? Well, I think it is. It looks like yeah, it looks like it. Yeah. Well, we don't want to go any deeper no, there, then, very much questions are not going. Yeah. We've uncovered a 200,000-year-old mammoth tusk, which could be as much as nine foot in length. But coming from the river channel, it can't help us find land, and we can't afford to be distracted by it. What's needed are seeds from mature plants, land snails and beetles, and that's where our environmental archaeologists come in. As we get down into this, we've got to be very careful because the environmental evidence is going to be very important. Yes. You know, we need to, we need to you know, identify the areas where we, we might take samples from it. Well, because we've got a view of the side of the section here, you can see this grey stuff. Look here. I'll just show you what I mean by this stuff. Yeah, okay. Hold on a minute. Um, where the sun's got at it, you'll see it's very pale. But yeah. when they get down to that, that stuff contains the animals and plants that actually lived in the bottom of the river. Right. So when you get down to that, let me know, because yeah. then we can take bulk samples of that. While we search the south end of our site for environmental clues to our land surface, Carenza and the survey team were with Christine using geology to find where the river flowed out of the north end. I can show you one of the oh, yes. Yes, river beds. So if you've it, got a channel, is that, that line? That look, that's it. That's down. a margin where the river has cut a groove in the clay and redeposited all sorts of material. So it's either a quiet water part of the river or it's material that's slumped from the, the bank. If you can help me to map individual snapshots of this river, then together with the geology, eventually we can pick to put together an idea of what we think was was going on. Perhaps you can show us, Christine, where this channel goes mm. across here, which give everyone <laughs> an idea of roughly what they're trying <laughs> to do. Sure, can we get out of here? That's probably the easiest place to Christine go. believes the river moved around a lot during the thousands of years it flowed through this site. But if geophys can show up the difference between the gravels and the clay, we should be able to chart the various courses the river channel carved out. A clear picture of the river's course across our site will increase the possibility of finding surviving land surfaces. But back at Trench 1, we seem to have narrowed the odds already. Oh, you've got something. Well, we've got a big tree here, about where Kate is. You've got wood there, haven't you? And it's certainly coming across to about here, look. Presumably, what's this, Kate, resting on the river bank, perhaps? Yes, well, great big chunks of tree like this tend to be more on margins than somewhere out in the middle of a stream, so it, it's an indication, as we have had with hazelnuts and land snails and other things around here, that we may be near to a margin. And what's so exciting End of the morning, and it looks like we've found our riverbank, complete with fallen oak trees. But is this yeah, habitable land? You tell me if I'm getting too excited or not, but I've got some flecks of charcoal down here. Do you, do you get that anyway? See down? Down here, look, I'm sure that, that looks like a bit there. And well, that's a bit there. You know, probably people better qualify than me on that, but I think we what we found before that it isn't charcoal, it's some kind of oxidization or something that's ah, created right. this blackness. Right. So it looks yeah. black, but it's not fire, in fact. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, that'd be so, I won't get excited. <laughs> <laughs> it'd be pretty amazing on our well, first scrape. It would, mm. it would, especially on my first scrape. <laughs> so these are actually the beetles from the sediment that had the trunks of oak in it. They so. are indeed. In this site, we've got species that come from uh, southeast Europe, from um, even Bosnia and Herzegovina, from Spain. Mm -hmm. But the bulk of the fauna is found in southern England at the present time. Right. And we can therefore conclude that the environment was warmer than now because mm -hmm. the species of beetle that are in here live south of this part, right. south of this area. Yeah. Let's see what else we can find. Come on. Did you say something, Mick? I've got another bone, I think, or whatever. I want to take instant, instant recognition. Looks like a, it is a bit of a mammoth tooth. Our first mammoth tooth, isn't it? Is <laughs> At six inches, Mick's mammoth tooth is smaller than an elephant's and shows our Mammuthus primogenicus was consuming lush, soft vegetation. Mammoths only have four teeth at any one time. As one wears down, it's replaced by another. The ridges on our tooth show this mammoth had already worn out three of his teeth. This tooth came from a mature animal, probably 30 years old. Smaller than an Indian elephant, a male mammoth from our site would have stood about 10 foot tall. Its size shows it had adapted to a warm climate. So as well as being a good two foot shorter than a woolly mammoth, it may well have been bald as well. But it was still found in the river, and Mick feels it's diverting us from the main task this weekend, finding the land. See, my, my inclination, Kate, would be to sink a trench across this to look for the old ground surface on, but I can see that you would risk going through a lot of stuff. But to pick up the relationship of the river to the ground alongside, and, and yes. if you like, accept that in one meter you're going to destroy yes. odd, the odd bone, the odd tusk or whatever, but you're leaving... That, that wouldn't be to... construed as being really bad archaeology, to plough through evidence it, of I think all it these depends animals. what you're trying to do, and one of the things that we intended to do here was to try and get the environmental context yes. sorted out. And I think it, um, to the information we would gain from a trench would far exceed the few yeah. things we might destroy. Yeah. Mick's proposing a huge gamble, destroying a wealth of finds we already know exist in search of better environmental pointers below. A second trench at right angles to our first would cut back through the tusks and teeth on the edge of the river bank. But would we find the land surfaces beyond them? That's for tomorrow. Today, we're relying on geophys. Yeah, well, I think it's quite exciting. Oh, really? We do actually appear to be getting some positive results. We oh, can't really? find really? anything magnetically. But with the resistance, we are getting changes. And, I mean, basically on the plot, below is where we think the clay is, the oxford clay. The black, then, are the high resistance. That's where we've got the gravel deposits on top of the clay, um, the oxford clay there. You were hoping for a channel going in that direction. That's and right. we've got certainly anomalies right. going in that way. I mean, it's easier to see on the screen. That's where we were stood. There was the cut at that point and there we've got a trend along there. So this time the clay in blue, the gravel in red, and right. well. Right, so you're gonna carry on that way? Well, we'll you... extend our survey areas in between where the trenches are at the moment oh. and hopefully join up the dots. Dots, that would be excellent. We seemed to have learned so much about the site in the past seven hours that I was beginning to wonder if we'd need three days here. But Mick decided I needed an overview to put today into perspective. The site just starts just to make some sense from up here, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, you can see what a, a sort of small patch we've got in the bottom of it, really. But why are we so locked into geology this week? It seems as though archaeology hasn't got a look in. Yeah, I think that's inevitable with something as early as this, really. You know, we're talking about 200,000 years ago. B, I mean, BC makes no difference, really, that, that length of time ago. And so, at that time, you're dealing with hunter-gatherers. Uh, they're very dependent on what resources the landscape's got in it, whether it's animals, plants, all the rest of it, the stuff they collect, they hunt, they fish. So, to some extent, you, you need to know something about that general background before you can see where people might have fitted in. Is there any realistic possibility of finding evidence of human settlement? I think it's a very, very long shot. 
The trouble is, you've got a landscape, as I say, that's been that's buried for a start. I mean, it's worse than looking for a needle in a haystack, isn't it? I mean, you've got you, everything you can see in front of you for many, many miles to the west of here. It's all gravel across to there. Now, there wouldn't have been many people living in that area. There might have been, say, one family operating over the whole of this area. So chances of finding their campsite <laughs> in this area, you know, are pretty remote, really. But somewhere in this landscape, between here and the horizon, there was a family hunting and operating. Yeah. We think it's, it's part of a um, mammoth skull. And, uh, Back on the ground, we've uncovered a whole jumble of bones. And then there's bone over there. So there's any amount of it. It's all over the place. It's getting really quite a complex little group of bone. Oh, yes. You see around there? Yeah. And then we got something now coming in there. But don't, be careful there, Tommy. Yeah. You've got bone all, right, all the way around there. Um, and then we got something else in. Mm. Well, you that's see the horn of a bison inside of a bison's oh. horn. Right. It's called a horn core. Right. Is that Cuts. another one? Uh, I can't really see yet. No. No, and then what, what we got coming through there then? That looks like a bit of mammoth limb. That's probably also limb, I don't think limb that's... Good, yes. Good. Should we knock it on the head for today? <laughs> it's getting a bit chilly, isn't it? It is freezing. Come and meet the Earthwatch people. Right. And, uh, well, well, and have a glass of wine. I just cleaned up my loose. <laughs> <laughs> to help us excavate as much of the site as possible over the next two days, we've been joined by volunteers from the Earthwatch charity. <laughs> So that's what it used to look like. Well, it's what it could have looked yeah. like. This yeah. is a sort of impression. This is Victor's first impression of yeah. the channel with a couple of islands. Um, this is sort of our best guess at the moment. And over the weekend, we can alter this impression as the data comes in. You know, we've all these bones seem to be accumulating on the edge of the river. And, you know, I mean, this is, if, if there's any evidence of people living there, then it will be on the riverbank. So we thought we ought to dig a couple of trenches back acro across the riverbank. In order to do that, we're going to have to plough through mammoth tusks and... Oh. That's going to be the hard <laughs> part. Heels, you know, goodness yeah. knows what. Meanwhile, it's left to Christine as the geologist to peg out Mick's second trench, ready for the digger to do its worst first thing in the morning. So tomorrow we're going to dig a big trench right through Kate's mammoth's tusks and bison's heels and all the other bones in order to see if we can establish what the environment's like further down. Let's hope it's a price worth paying. See you after the break. <laughs> Start of day two, and a complete change in the weather means a complete change in conditions at the site. Five hours of solid rain have reverted the Oxford clay to the sticky mud that once lay at the bottom of the prehistoric ocean. While the Earthwatch volunteers shelter from the weather, we have to cope with the problems it's causing. Yesterday's excavation needs a cover. The rain could also affect the geophys results. We are making progress with Mick's trench, which is looking for the old land surface beyond our riverbank. But in all this mud, are we really going to find anything? It's actually hailing in my tea. <laughs> <laughs> well, the late 20th century interglacial appears to be over and we're diving back into another ice age. What are we going to do, Mick? Well, we've got this trench that been dug. Morning, Kate. Good morning. Let's Just uh, have a look. It's been a very interesting exercise, yeah. actually, digging this. The digger driver was here at eight o'clock and gathering yes. this weather. It was snowing at there. snowing yes. then. What have we got then? Well, we thought over there with all those silts that we had very nearly the margin of the channel deposits. Yeah. By taking this through, we realised that we've got yet another cut in the channel uh, here. We thought we'd get the bank, didn't we, somewhere over here? Over there. Yeah. In fact, we've got another cut which links up with one probably over there, maybe going in that right, direction. Right, right. John, have you got those shells? So we've got a whole series of river channels, have we, through here? Yeah, so you get these shells which are coming out of this area here. Yeah. And in fact, the margin of the channel is over there where it meets the oxidised clay, yeah. that orange yeah. clay over there. Well, can have a look. And these, what have we got there, These then? are freshwater mollusks that only live in warm water. So we're in a warm period with these, yes. then. Yeah. 
So Mick's second trench hasn't revealed our land surface. We had thought that the edge of the trench here, where we found the wooden bones yesterday, was the start of the river's bank. But as we go back into where the land surface should be, the soil and silt that's covering the clay dips back into the orange gravel of the river channel. So what we actually have is merely an island between two of the river's channels. Back in the dry, Russell is explaining why we're unlikely to find an intact land surface at this end of the site. Okay. Now, this is the situation when the channel was functional. Right. And in this, we've got all sorts of animals. On the side of it, we've got all sorts of animals. Mammoths doing their vast droppings here and the dung beetles falling in and all sorts of things. Now, time goes by, you're getting the, the whole area is gradually cut down. This is what they call their cold gravels. And the land surface disappears too. Yeah. That's right. That's right, get rid of it. Get rid of all that and in, in this you're getting rid of all the evidence of the mammoths and you're getting rid of all the evidence of possible human beings. Now, somehow you've got to highlight this as the last bit of that surface which we started with. Because if this is the north end, mm -hmm. that's a little bit that's surviving. Right. It's the last bit of the land surface that okay. didn't get eroded can we, can away. We do that right. show that over okay. The rain stopped. The sun's coming out. Just at the moment when we managed to get this temporary roof over the trench, the weather takes a turn for the better. But I hadn't realised that the rain is so problematic when you're digging because it makes the earth so much heavier. Normally you can just fill a bucket with this sort of shale stuff and chuck it on the spoil heap. But as soon as it starts raining, everything's about five times as heavy and all of the soggy earth sticks to your shovel and sticks to everything that you're using to scrape the little finds with. It's murder. How are you getting on, Phil? It's all happening here, Tony. It really is. What um, you doing? I don't know if you remember last night we had this bit here which we thought was a part of a, a mammoth skull. And then we had here a, a bison horn. Well, we've cleared all the way round that, and we've now got bone which comes all the way round there. This is all bone. So I'm pretty sure that this is all part of this, this massive bison skull. And then we got something else, another piece of bone running in there. And then here, we appear to have part of a tusk, which has been sliced off when they machined out the gravel. So we've only got basically half of it. And here, what do you think of this here then? That is massive. Look at that. Can is you that see mammoth? What, that's mammoth tusk, yeah. But you see what it's doing? It's running right in underneath all that lot of bone. So how long do you think that it will take you to, to tidy all this up? Can, can we get it done by tomorrow night? We can have a try, but we're not going to certainly risk ripping it out just for the sake of getting it finished. It's got to be done right if we're going to do it at all. And yet yesterday we were blithely happy to cut through all the bones to get to the environmental stuff. I'm really split down the middle. Half of me thinks this is really interesting and that what we ought to be doing is protecting it. And the other half of me says that in three days, really what we ought to be doing is getting further down and uh, getting some more environmental evidence. Well, we have done that with machine trenches. And so, we, I mean, with that, the idea of those trenches is so that we can and get, get our environmental evidence. So really, we're getting two bites of the cherry. It seems the Ice Age gravels have sliced off any old land surface at the south end of the site. But at the north end, where Russell believes we'll still find a land surface, Kate's team were keen to show us what they'd uncovered. That's what, 200,000 years old, That's is it? at least 200,000 years. It's mm. probably not in situ. That is a, a piece of wood that's been deposited there. Yeah. But this area here, you can see from the tentacles of roots that are coming out and the little stumps, remnants of stumps that are sticking yeah. up, yeah. that this is a land surface undisturbed from 200,000 years ago or more. Perhaps. Right. It's incredible. These pieces of wood are the roots and stumps of trees which actually grew beside our river. We found a tiny piece of the land surface. Yeah. What strikes me is it is 
so incredibly small. I mean, it's like a sixpence in the whole yeah. in the whole quarry yeah. that is surviving. And this fits with exactly what you were saying earlier about this is the the edge of the riverbank that survived, yeah. And, yeah. and here it is. And that it, seems to me right. remarkable. I mean, quite incredible. How do we feel about disturbing any of this? Then, I mean, it's all going to be buried eventually. Isn't we it? have recorded it, drawn it, photographed it, and sampled it. So I'm ready now to take it down yeah. further to see whether there's any more roots underneath. Basically, it's an indication of how profitable it's going to be. Just look at the way the mollusks are, yes. are washed yeah. out on yeah. the surface. Yeah. Just there, and you can the, the one that the rather bigger thing there is Corbicula fluminalis. That is exciting because its nearest locality that's at the moment is in. Here, is it? That's the one. Its nearest locality at the moment is in the Nile in Egypt. So it's beginning to tell you there's yeah. some exciting signal yeah. in here. Yeah. Whatever exciting that signal. Let's, let's let's get on with it. That's so indeed. we get cracking at it. In the gravels that now fill the channel, Kate's found a number of stone tools, including flint hand axes. Because they've been found in the river, they were probably washed here, maybe from miles away. Still, that does mean man was in the area, and it gives one of the country's top stone tool experts a chance to do what he does best, flint napping. So you've got this family of nomadic people, right? And they <laughs> pick up a piece of flint like this, and yeah. then what do they do with it? Well, I suspect they would probably go on for something a bit more manageable like that. <laughs> and uh, really, they're just probably running around up on the Chilterns, and they pick up a stone like that and the first thing they do is what we would call alternate flaking which is one flake off one side and one flake off the other side and they just go around the edge like that this is well, it's really all about. We see already we've got something which is really very much a, a functional tool. I mean, you know, you can. You can just knock these out whenever you want them. And did different tribes of people make them in a different way? No, no. I mean, you can find, you can find um, axes that were made in Africa. You could virtually put them alongside some that was made in Oxford. You couldn't tell the difference. You see, what well, just lately I've been using a, an antler. Um, How you know, do you know that they would have? And bone hammers have been found on sites of you know this sort of age. Mm. So I mean, this is only one example of a soft hammer, which sometimes won't take the piece of flint away. And. Really shouldn't be doing that. So, funnily enough, it's, it's one of these really weird things. It's, it's kind of nice because I can look at an implement, and maybe I don't know, all those years ago, and you realise just how human they were. Because they do exactly what I do. You see a bit of flint, you think I want to get rid of that, and you know. You shouldn't try to get rid of it because it'll probably bust the piece. But because you're human, you think, well, I've really got to give it a go. And they just went through exactly the same things. And you can look at a piece, you know, maybe 400,000 years after it was made, and you think, oh, come on, you're trying to get that piece of flint off. There's no way they're going to get that piece of flint. They knew it. I know it. And it's just one of these amazing things you can... You can see a bit you of can, personality you can, in the you can bridge. You can bridge a gap. Yeah. I mean, one of the great sort of uh, comparisons that's been made was like calling it the original Swiss Army knife. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you name it, they probably used it for that particular purpose. Butchery, scraping, chopping, cutting. But you know, okay, that's a, that's a pretty rough hand axe. But um, the thing of it is, it works. Well, it only took, that probably took about four minutes. Well, that, there you go. It? I mean, you saw me make it. Yeah. We've been sat here. Okay, we're just a bit confused at, about what we are actually tracing on the, the ground. Uh, I don't know, did you see those results no, yesterday? No. Basically, this is the 
this gravel, the face uh, along here. Mm -hmm. The thought was that that's going along this line. We've now done work at the other end, this end of this end, yes. uh, the, the site. And so we're still getting trends following similar directions. So the, the real difficulty we've got, because we're looking at keyhole areas, when we're seeing changes between the gravels and the clays, we can't actually be confident that we've got an edge to a river bed. Mm. We may just be seeing undulations within mm. that. So it's going to be very difficult for us to join up lines and say to you, there yeah. is no, one sure. major river channel. Why don't you geophys the middle? There's no space. That's the major problem. No space? It's all covered in trees and we've got the tents here and everything. We can't get to the site, we can't, no access for it. Can you pass me the call? So that's our feeling. We need to do some more work, but... Even, Mick, even a song. Mick, can you hear me? It's a Tony. A sample may help if we're getting you know, the same pattern. Hello, Tony, I yeah, it's Mick, over. To find a yeah. river. I'm talking to John uh, in, the, uh, in, in the tent, an and mm. he's a bit stuck, really. He can't tell whether he's got one big river or lots of little bits unless he geophysses the middle of our area. Well, I've got Carenza over here as well, and we're both sort of nodding to each other, so I suppose we could take it as that. <laughs> executive decision. Uh, it's a sort of executive decision. I mean, I, I'm quite keen that we should get, um, you know, as a, 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 a complete a plan so that we can do the reconstructions on the screen uh, of what the landscape was like, and, and this is all part of the landscape work. So that, uh, yeah, I think we should go ahead with that. Okay, well, we're trying to get some people together, and maybe you could at your end and have a go at clearing a bit more of the site. Okay. Okay, thanks, Tony. We'll come over and have a look when we just uh, looked at what we've got over at the north end of the site here. While Mick and wood expert Rowena Gale set to work identifying our 200,000 year old trees, we start clearing today's vegetation from the middle of the site. Back in the air shelter, Rowena is trying to match thin slices of the wood samples to slices from modern trees. I hope she succeeds. There, Tony. Chuck, chuck that down a minute. Come and have a look at this. You were talking about how, how sharp a piece of flint is and how much it does it cut in. Think of that, then. Did you make that flint? Yep. That's just one of the ones I saw when we were sat over there this afternoon. It's amazing, isn't it? Okay. Have you seen this before? Ever That's seen anybody work with a piece of flint on a, on meat before? Well, I haven't, but one of the research students gave a set of flakes, hand axes and things to a local butcher who butchered a roe deer, and the thing he found the best for doing the whole deer without making any mess at all was one flint flake. I believe that. With the whole carcass. Yeah. So, uh, what are you waiting for? I mean, I thought you were making a fire so we could cook this stuff up. Well, I'll stick this on the barbie. Take the first plate away. Just uh, about another 45 we need. Oh, well. <laughs> Tonight, we decided to eat prehistoric style with just a few concessions to the 20th century, metal barbecues, plates, and of course, veggie burgers for Mick. I think it's, it's a mammoth dropping, Mick. A mammoth <laughs> dropping, fine, that's, that's what wonderful. What <laughs> but at least some of us were prepared to enter into the spirit of the occasion. Oh, what? It's the cooks who do the job. Right, what are we gonna do tomorrow? Carry on. <laughs> Where's Rowena? Have you managed to get the uh, data together yet? Yes. The spread out rooty bit is uh, almost certainly a willow. Outside chance it might be poplar, but it's more likely to be willow. So we've got willows growing on the riverbank, growing into the... Yeah. Yes, yeah. seems so. And the, the long, thin bit beside it uh, is not from the same... 
um, tree or bush. It's most probably um, elder, but I'd still like to have another look at that and make certain about that. I mean, this, this is very interesting because he's showing us in detail what the local landscape was like next to the river. And that's presumably a climate that's not particularly hot or cold. No, it, it's, it's, temperate. it's rather yes. temperate yes. like today. Yes, yeah, mm. that's very good. Yes. Uh, so that gives us a picture of the immediate locality along this bed of the river. There's and do you <laughs> think there is a realistic possibility that by the end of tomorrow we'll have a picture of this whole environment? Yeah, I, I don't see any problem with that. I think the amount of background information that, that's come out of this small area in, in, with what Kate's done before and what we've managed to gather is incredible. You know, we've got a whole batch of techniques, they're all producing useful stuff. I've no doubt about that at all. So, it's the end of day two. Let's hope we've got the big picture tomorrow. Stay with us. Nine o'clock, day three, and we've been given a helping hand by the owners of the quarry. Their giant earth mover is going to clear away all the spoil heaps that are preventing geophys from surveying the centre of the site. There are some advantages to digging in a gravel pit after all. Clearing a whole new area on the site hasn't only helped the survey team, it's also allowed Mick a chance to dig an even deeper trench. This time, where our geophys results predict we'll find the course of the river in the middle of our site. Hang, hang on, John. Oh, yeah, look at that. It's, uh, that's good condition. That, that's, that's good condition. That could be quite a recoverable task. So th this is out of stuff that we've actually cut through just. Oh, that, yeah, last yeah. load. So that was the last load, which yeah. is going which into was the from clay, so it was somewhere down the that, base. Is that pink in there? Is, is that possibly? No, that's, that's... Dry fear. No, no, hang on, hang on, hang on. Well, that's the only pink bit I can no, see. No, I, I think... I think you'll find... That's it, is it? Have a look. It's very smashed, but it looks the right stuff. I think I think we you know we're prepared mm. to sacrifice a little bit right. to gain the overall picture of the of the environment and yes. so on. So we ought to carry on with this now, haven't we? Right. Okay. Well, what about this edge we've got here? We saw it in the previous trench we did yesterday. Yeah. If I just move this material back a little bit, you can see that very, very approximately that line there divides clean clay from the gravel. We don't really want to go any more into that, do we? Or do we want to empty that out? Well, we are. We, the idea is to take the, the whole thing down to the clay right. and back, and then we, we'll see it in section. You'll be able to pick it up and survey it. Yes, in, but if that. If, uh, if we can have somebody in with a with a scale rule and a grid, we we'll just take a photograph of this. Yeah. So we have it recorded. Then we'll we'll, we'll excavate it out and carry mm -hmm. on. Great. So we can now start to plot the course of our river across the site, and we can populate its edges with the animals we've found, like the bison, which Victor's sketching here. The bones we've uncovered this weekend also give us clues as to climate and environment on our site. But by far the best information will come from the insects, mollusks and aquatic life hiding in the soil samples collected by our environmental team, who are now busily washing and sieving the earth from Trench 3. Ah, there's one, look at the yeah. little, little round one there. Yeah, there's one, just there, but there's another one up here. And these are both land snails. And that one down there, the round one, is trickier hispida. It's yeah. not very fussy, it lives anywhere. So that's not much use to us, really? Not much it? use. No. What about that one? Is that a bit now, this one's a This one's a pupilla muscorum. It likes dry grassland, right. open areas. So it's not a dense woodland. How would we know how far these might have washed? I mean, they're very small and light. I could imagine they, they, they could have could, come a long They way. could wash a long way. But by looking at all the species, yeah. we and can actually start seeing... seeing if it fits in with yeah. the other evidence. That's right. So if, if, yes. if the species look cohesive, it looks like we have a, a single uh, assemblage from a single um, environment, and we can combine that with Russell's insect information, yeah. and combine it with the wood identifications, that, that's the way you can tell the big story. Yeah. That's the way we can get the information. And if it's not just this one line of evidence, it's the combination of all the lines yeah. of evidence that is really important. And that's what we're beginning to get now. It's really, it's, it's really getting very exciting. By this afternoon, we should have a really good picture, shouldn't we? I hope so.
While Mike sieved today's samples, Russell and fishbone expert Brian Irving were examining yesterday's catch under the microscope. Tony, come and look at this. We've got a story here. Um, now, Brian, you explain. What's well, I've been looking at the um, fish bones here, and um, we do have ra rather a large species list now. We have a lot of fish here which are still common in the British Isles, but uh, we have three, three spined stickleback, pike, perch, eel, bream, gudgeon, dace, chub, roach, so, so it's rather a long list. Um, what does that tell us about the kind of water that they would have been? Well, in? all of, of, of the, the bones are from very, very small fish. So with these being so small, it's probably a very, a very, very small water course. And then we've got the eel as well, and uh, Ro Ro Russell made a, an interesting comment about the eel. Well, the interesting thing about the eel is it spawns in the sea. Yeah. Now, the presence of eels here means, first of all, they could get to the sea, the adults, and it means that the youngsters coming back must have come back on the Gulf Stream. So the Gulf Stream must be washing our west coast at this time, and it's the Gulf Stream which is responsible for our uh, warm climate. It's lunchtime day three, and we've got an absolute avalanche of information coming in here now. We've got Russell working on the beetles, we've got snails and seeds here. Karenza's doing the mapping. Here's the geophys going into the computer. Victor's working on the animals. Steve's creating a grid which shows us what the riverbank would have been like. And Stuart's plotting everything onto uh, a big plan. And I'm beginning to get a picture of life here 200,000 years ago, that there would have been uh, a big river meandering through here, and the whole landscape would have been a bit like the African savannah, although maybe the temperature would have been a bit more like southern France nowadays. And on the banks there'd have been oak and willow trees, but it wouldn't have been thickly forested, because if you think of the size of the animals that uh, we've been picking up remains of, they would have been the sort of animals which would have bashed down the trees and knocked the trunks into this thick, caked, cracked mud on the river bank that would have been crawling with frogs and beetles and little snails. It's good, isn't it? But what I don't yet understand is how our early ancestors, Stone Age people, fitted into this landscape. In the centre of our site, Mick's deep trench is complete. Well, how are you going on then, John? We've been hearing great things. Yeah, it's been very good. It's a hell of a length now, isn't it? Yeah, it must be close on 65 metres now. Oh. It's, a, it's a really, truly splendid trench. Yeah. Anyway, the, out of it. That's the, the, the thing, exciting it? thing is this. Ah. It is, it's an elephant tooth. Oh, an elephant. elephant. So does that help us with the environment, whether it's hot, cold, whatever? Well, yes, elephants are only warm. Right. And this right. is so really, really, really good, phase, good stuff. Yeah. Yes. Looks Amazing. in good condition as well. God. It's very yep. solid. Well, it's good. Really good. What about uh, other stuff? Because I see there's a, there's a bucket down here with something in as we came across. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's some in... It wasn't just somebody's lunch, you know. Funny you should say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in the bucket, we saw some wood near the surface when we stripped it. And oh, this is, this is yeah, yeah. if you look at the curvature of that, of that wood, it's a fairly large trunk we're dealing with. Yeah. So we can get that looked at and see what sort of... Uh, Yep. Wood that yeah, is. Yeah, identification. Looks yeah. like oak, actually. It's really well preserved. The across it. Yeah. yeah. We haven't finished yet. We haven't finished. Right. There's, there's, there's even thing, better. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the this is the the river bank getting deeper. Yeah. And we then found these bones, which although very dirty and smashed, they are. I've been told they're the. Uh, one that's, of the leg bones of a mammoth. That's Good a, Lord alive. A big, uh, a big slab, isn't it? It's very it? heavy, isn't it? It's very uh, solid. That, uh, joint, isn't it? Yep. You can see the bone structure in this, actually, yeah. can't you? Although it's, um, that's great, isn't it? Kate? Yeah. What have you been doing while we've been at dinner then? We've been hearing great <laughs> things. <laughs> I've been drawing. You must have been getting pretty excited about yeah, all this. It's a fantastic looking bone here. But the, all, all this stuff coming out all over the place now. Mm. I mean, it's, it's a... What? Look at this, look at this. <laughs> What's that then? Have a look, have to have a, have a little pick at the end first. 
You can tell by the wear surfaces on it. What, this what? is a horse shin oh. bone. Right. It's quite a short, stocky kind of little brute. Sort of yeah, yeah, like well. The environmental finds from this trench tell us even more. What, what you can do is, in the channel, there are prostrate trees. Yes. We know yeah. that they are submerged trees because they've got beetles that need submerged trees. Right? Now, the, 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 so that in a natural environment, trees would fall in the river, and instead of the water authority coming and cleaning them off, they would, be, in fact, be just washed downstream. Mm -hmm. Now, so there are trees which are in here. Now, we know from yesterday that we have willows along the edges. Yes. Yeah. The snails are telling you that the margins of the river are very weedy. That's so right. Even though the water course itself yeah. might be quite yeah. narrow, you've got a nice Green. wide marshy Changes area. Yeah, there's so a lot of that's right. There's a lot, a lot of pond, emergent pond vegetation, weeds, pond that's weed right. seeds, things like that. So yes. you've got quite a lot. It's not it's not a definite boundary this side of the river. You're talking wet marsh. And you've areas. got pond, you have grading yeah. into meadow, yeah. and occasional open tree. Yeah. I suppose. I would like, greener at the margin. I would like some good ripples to distinguish the ripples exactly. from the pools. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it was, there are two clear-cut ha aquatic habitats. Right. One is the pool of slowly Stagging. flowing water, yes. and this goes with the mole's tone, mm -hmm. and some of it which is rippling and running fast. fast yeah. flowing river. Oh, now, the only yeah. evidence that I've got are from the caddisflies. And the caddisflies say moving water on a mature stream. Yeah. Now, mature is usually a matter a measure of velocity, not size. Mm -hmm. um, but in other words, it's not a trickling stream. It is a proper mm -hmm. yeah. small river. Small river. Okay. But has our final trench proved Geophys right? Have they found the edge of our channel? How does this fit with all the stuff we... When we I mean, when we started, John, you were very... Skeptical? No, I'd have, I'd have, <laughs> <laughs> I'd have put it stronger, though. You were Ready very, to go home? You were, yeah, exactly. You were iffy yeah. about whether you were going to get anything out of it at all, weren't you? Well, I, I wasn't that confident. No. I, I think... And now? Well, now. Well, <laughs> well yeah, uh, I think... We, we were told by geophysics that, that the edge of the trench, the edge of the, the deeper part of the channel was here. And guess what we've got? And the edge is. of the channel. Well done. Well, well, I think the most exciting thing from yeah. our point of view is to be able to use the bits in between that we haven't dug from your survey and see where so, to dig. So you've got whatever, a year or more to go, mm. or a couple <laughs> of seasons to go, yes. and you can now see where perhaps you might you might want to dig. But we won't dig in any of the bald bits on your... That's it. I mean, right. we can give you a plan by the end of today, yes. certainly, of the main area yeah. that's been stripped that's and covered our, now. our point of view, it's, that's wonderful to have a... I mean, it must be, must be pretty encouraging for you, John, mustn't it, to actually be able to put geophysics and this sort of site... Yes, it must be another well, I mean, first. It's, it's different. It yeah. certainly is different. Um, <laughs> not something we do every day of the week. We've now got only a few hours left to record and preserve everything we've found this weekend. We won't have the time to lift our first find, the tusk, or search for man on our newly discovered land surface. But as Mick says, looking for our ancestors on a site this big, encompassing such a vast period in prehistory, is like looking for a needle in a haystack. Now, I'm just beginning to get my head around the enormity of the time scale involved in this week's dig. If you think of this horizon as a massive continuum of time, then the remnants of the first man that's ever been found in Britain, Boxgrove Man, we can place round about where that grey hopper is over there. And then there were lots of ice ages and warmer periods and more ice ages until the period that we're looking at this week, the warm interglacial at Stanton Harcourt, is about where that white van is there. And that continued for about 50,000 years until where that yellow digger is. And then there was another ice age and a warm period and another ice age which ended around about where those trees are. That's the beginning of the Middle Stone Age, the Mesolithic, where you saw lots of hunter-gatherers appearing on the scene. And then the Bronze Age is round about where that triangular tower is. And the present day is where that big square tower is. And if you want to put your own life into the equation, well, each human life is about the width of my thumb. Sobering thought, isn't it? We may not have found man, but we have discovered more than enough to give us a clear picture of the environment here 200,000 years ago. Our geophys survey has clearly given us the channels of our river. We've found at least one intact land surface, and geophys has pointed Kate in the right direction of a second. She can now spend the time she's allowed to remain on this site excavating these former land surfaces. 
Our environmental evidence shows our river moved through flood to periods of drought in a climate as warm as southern Europe. There were willows in the river margins and a forest of oak and alder on its banks. Kate now knows the animals she's found, the bison, the horse, the mammoth and the straight-tusked elephant, lived as well as died here. And her excavations may yet reveal evidence of human life. <laughs>